The following program is a UW-TV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. I'm Marcia Alvar. The ancient Mayas of southern Mexico and Central America were accomplished in astronomy, mathematics, and architecture. For many years, it was believed that they were a utopian society, a peaceful pre-Columbian model for our troubled times. But recent scholarship has put a more complex face on the Mayas, and among those most responsible is Linda Sheely, professor of art at the University of Texas at Austin. Sheely helped crack the code of Mayan glyphs and has written extensively on the culture. She is co-author of a new book, Maya Cosmos, 3,000 Years on the Shaman's Path. Welcome to Upon Reflection. Hi. Who were the Maya as we know and understand them today? Um, they're the people that occupy and have occupied since at least 2000 or 3000 BC the Yucatan Peninsula. There are 35 documented Mayan languages, of which maybe 25 are still spoken. And uh, there are still probably five to seven million people who speak a Mayan language first. Well, we believed for many years that this was the, uh, a very peaceful society. Now we know it was quite different. I think it was described as a, as a culture deeply steeped in war, sacrifice, blood, and magic. Yeah, we don't, you know, you don't really want to emphasize that so much. What the contrast is that before the decipherment occurred, the Maya were like a tabla rasa in which we could write an image of our own hopes on it. The men who did that, basically J. Eric Thompson and to some degree Sylvanus Morley, were people who had fought in World War I, lived through the era of Hitler, seen the Holocaust, lived through World War II, and then had entered the, the Cold War and seen Korea and so forth. And I think for those people, what they really wanted more than anything else in the world is to find a place where people didn't make war and where they weren't violent. And uh, their experience with the Maya in uh, Yucatan and in Belize was a peaceful one because uh, the villagers they saw, the towns they saw, and uh, their interactions with the Maya were entirely peaceful. And so they came to the conclusion that's the way the Maya had lived uh, their entire history. But in fact, what they were doing is they were experiencing people who had been under 500 years of violent suppression. And if you live with a dominant culture around that will kill you, if you protest, then you also become peaceful or you become rebels. Maya have been rebelling for 500 years. There's just a whole history, the caste wars. There's been one rebellion after another, but usually by individual communities, not by the Maya as a whole. And so the, 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 uh, the vision of the Maya as pastoral uh, people who raised corn and went into the cities once or twice a year where astronomer priests watched the stars and were involved in mathematics and this whole image was an image of a society and of a people that never existed on earth. I mean, nobody's ever lived that way. And what happened when we started uh, uh, doing the decipherment is we discovered, my God, they had politics. They had their Bill Clintons and their Reagans <laughs> and yeah. And uh, they, the, the, they, they had wars and they had marriages and they had alliances. They had all the things of history that, that we know that the, the Egyptians had, that the Greeks had, that the Romans had, that the Chinese had, all of the, the peoples of the world. The decipherment of the glyphs, of course, is key to what we've learned in the last 20 years, and it's, and it's a, mm -hmm. a process that you were very involved in. And before uh, we, we began taping this program, I was joking with you about the serendipity that mm -hmm. seems to be involved in your life. Tell me how you got involved in deciphering the glyphs. Uh, my husband and I went down in 1970 as uh, tourists and uh, went to Palenque. We, we, we were going to go to Yucatan, which is what everybody does. You know, you want to go to Chichen and Uxmal and all of the famous sites. 
and uh, noticed at the last minute this funny little place that we pronounced Palinqui at the time uh, was just off the road and we went and uh, left 12 days later. You flipped a coin to decide whether or not to go. Oh, to actually, Europe. I was from Central Tennessee, and I, uh, being an inland person, I always, uh, whenever possible, without any rational decision, went for the sea. <laughs> and if you look at Mexico maps, there are two roads: one that goes by the coast, and the other that goes inland. And at the last minute, we decided to go inland so we could go to the site. And it was only later that I learned that the coastal road was a figment of the cartographer's imagination <laughs> and does, in fact, not exist. So when you took the, uh, the fateful road, what did you find? What happened? Um, it's kind of hard to describe. Um, people who, who have been to Palenque and have had it happen to them understand what I mean. Uh, Palenque at the time, it, it's much more cut now than it was then, but at the time, it was uh, in the most gorgeous forest you can imagine. Uh, it was not very much visited. You could still, for instance, park your car and camp out in the parking lot of the site. There's no way you can do that now. Uh, there were howler monkeys living in the trees. And uh, uh, most of the people that got to Palenque were people who were a little bit more adventuresome than the normal tourists. Off the beaten track. And uh, for instance, if you walked out into the forest, there were these absolutely gorgeous streams that, that tumbled down through the forest. As they came down, they dissolved the calcium, and the water was very heavy in calcium uh, uh, minerals, so that as it evaporated, it, would, it was making filiferous limestone. It was taking leaves and coating them with, uh, with calcium, it was it was like it was like a magic world that uh, you know I'd never seen before, and I fell in love with it and wanted to understand it. And you and you ended up going back, staying yeah, for a while. Yeah, I, I I remember there's a famous Mexican guide at Palenque named Moises Morales, and again, people who have gone there will know that name, and uh, he was part of the fascination. And I told him when we left that I would be back for the summer. Having now gone and seen people fall in love and do this sort of thing with my ruins, I understand his reaction now because he sort of said, ha ha, yeah, <laughs> right? But I did go back. I spent the entire summer and then the next summer and the next summer. And uh, the first years, were I basically used the architecture as the entry to try and understand what they were doing. And then I figured out I couldn't understand the architecture, what was going on, without understanding the pictures. And then there were all these funny little squiggly things <laughs> in the middle of the pictures. And I thought, well, maybe they'll tell me what the pictures are saying. And uh, it happened and the rest to be. Is history, as yeah, they it, say. It, well, I, I really want to emphasize also that um, People who write about this and people, reporters and so forth, love to make it into the story of the sort of the adventure of one person. Uh, the decipherment has not, more than anything else, its characteristic has been that it has been a collaborative process. And many, many people have been involved in it. And it is the teamwork of putting linguists together with art historians and archaeologists and all sorts of things that have that have made it work and well, that's that, an important thing to talk about. Talk more about the, the interdisciplinary nature of, of the work that you've done but first we have um, some videotape of you in the field. This is not at Palenque but it's at Copan. Can you talk a bit about where this this tape comes from? Well um, I have a friend uh, Ira Abrams at the University of Texas who's a filmmaker and about uh, I guess it was 89 we went together to Copan for a short visit and he decided to take his Hi8 camera with him just to see if, uh, you know, what he would get filming at the site in case we ever wanted to make a, a film together. Interesting. And these are outtakes from the, from the film that we did. And this is in Honduras? Honduras, right. It's just across the border. I like to talk of Copan as the sister city of Palenque. It's the only city that's as beautiful as Palenque. It's very different in style. And here it uh, is. We're looking. Yeah. This is in the East Court. And these are just pieces of building. These, these are, are called a how faces, little uh, faces of lords. This is the East Court. That's a false ball court you're seeing there. And beautiful little rampant jaguar 
uh, standing on either side of the stairs. Uh, that's what a building looks like when it's been restored, and this is what it looks like when you find it uh, as an archaeologist with the, the, the stones all tumbled down. A good archaeologist would be able to number those stones and put it back together like this. Uh, and the restoration work has taken place since this film was shot? No, this, most of what you're seeing now in, in restoration work comes from the 1930s. This is a, one of the Venus gods that's on the top of the stairs so that it ties it. Uh, this actually is what excavation looks like. Uh, you're seeing those piles of dirt and, and, and sand there. And you. Uh, and me <laughs> are uh, being used in the restoration of those uh, terraces back there. The philosophy is uh, don't restore what you can't prove was there. This is a plaster bird, a giant macaw, uh, that was found inside one of those terraces. And what the archaeologists did is they just went down behind the plaster uh, to expose the bird. They'll draw it, photograph it, and then to protect it, they'll rebury it. This is going inside the tunnels. And this is a film of a building called Rosalila, uh, the most extraordinary piece of architecture, archaeology, really, in a very long time in the Maya. This is a whole double-storied building with a roof comb and all of its plaster decoration intact. It was buried inside uh, uh, the building that we saw at the very beginning. And a Honduran archaeologist named uh, Ricardo Gussier has been excavating it. This is a bird wing in huge plaster. That's about 15 feet high. What you're looking at there is about seven, eight feet high. It's a great open mouth serpent. Um, in, in almost all archaeology, uh, the building will be cut off at the knees, and this is the only complete one we found. This is again outside looking at uh, piles of stones from the upper roofs of buildings. Okay? And uh, that's uh, Temple 22. Again, uh, uh, this is, they leave the trees at the ruins for the tourists to give them a little shade and, and make it a little bit more romantic. Uh, Maya would not have had trees. And this is a stela, a uh, portrait of a king named Washak Lahun Ubak Awil in Maya, 18 rabbit in English, uh, standing at the end of the 140 or 140th year of their equivalent of a millennium. Some footage from uh, Copan mm -hmm. yeah. in Honduras. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the, the fact that a lot of different people were involved mm -hmm. in, the, in the translation of the glyphs. When you were looking at what you called the squiggles, mm -hmm. do you remember when all of a sudden it made sense to you that the yeah, breakthrough? Yeah, it actually, it, it, it's actually a s single moment. Now, this doesn't mean we could read the entire script. That's still an ongoing process. But it was at the first conference I ever attended, it called the first Mesa Redonda of Palenque. There was a crazy young Australian named Peter Matthews. He's now at the University of Calgary in Canada. And uh, th this was a wonderful meeting, one of the pivotal meetings of the last uh, 30 years. Uh, I was a 28-year-old artist, or I guess I was 30 by then. He was a 19-year-old uh, a junior from the University of Calgary. And uh, he had done a project for his teacher in which he had put all of the inscriptions of Palenque together and gotten all of the dates that had ever been published and found some of his own solutions. So he had these big notebooks. And on the last day of the conference, we suggested that maybe he and I could go through all of these books and look for the kings of Palenque. Now, I had read all of the published books on the glyphs and had just said to myself, God, this is just too complicated. I can't do this, and nobody's ever going to read it. But we started about 1.30 in the afternoon after lunch. We went through every inscription. We were looking for a single glyph that was a title that someone else had identified. We just went through and found every example of that title, found the glyph next to it, found the nearest date, figured out if, if, the, if someone had already figured out what the verb was. We said, okay, this is his birth, and maybe this is when he died and stuff like that. Three hours, we put together 200 years of history. It's a remarkable accomplishment. Well, no, it's not an accomplishment because that's not the way it works. It's, it's in, in glyphs now, there are, are two principal kind of glyphers, three actually. Okay. Glyphers. Glyphers. 
or epigraphists <laughs> if you want to be very formal. I like glyphers. Uh, there are linguistic glyphers who are essentially interested in trying to decipher the system and understand the grammar and so forth. Uh, they sit down and, and look at it every day and say, God, I wonder what this sign means. You know? <laughs> and there are the historical epigraphers. And what the historical epigraphers are trying to do, or glyphers, is we're trying to understand what the history was and what religion was and, and so forth. We don't ever sit down, ah, today I'm going to decipher this glyph. We say, ah, I wonder what's written in this text and what the history is and so forth. And lots of times we just play. It's just complete play. And we sit down and we'll say, okay, let's go over the text of Tikal again or the text of Copan. We'll just sit go by. And then we'll make connections that we hadn't seen before. And those connections will accidentally lead to a discovery or to a new possibility for a reading. And then once you get one possibility for a reading and you're pretty sure that's right, that leads to others until it accelerates. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's logarithmically goes faster and faster and faster. So it's a less of a remarkable accomplishment than a remarkable set of discoveries. And, and, and luck. And luck. And, but, because it's serendipitous. And, and basically what we do is we find people that we work very well with. Like right now, I got about four different teams with different people in it that I work with. We sit down and play. And we're confident that if we spend a summer playing, that a lot of little bitty, teeny, chuggy discoveries will come out. We publish the, the now that we've got computers and desktop publishing, we publish them and circulate them very fast, either in letters or in little notes. And then other people react, and they send back us their ideas. And it's just very, very fast, and it's a, it's a really wonderful feedback loop. It's a way. Actually, it's the way I think most science works, but we, we don't like to admit it to the public. <laughs> we, like, we like the public to believe that we're doing it on purpose. The excitement of the discovery is very much a part of this book, Maya Cosmos. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have written a book that just said, boom, 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 this is the way it was, but the whole book is interlaced with personal stories mm -hmm. of discovery and how you came to know things. To, to at least get a, a slight handle on the world view of these people. Tell me the, probably the most important central myth to any culture, the, the creation myth, and how these people thought their world began. Uh, first of all, to understand the Maya, you have to understand this is, Maya don't have one world. All Mesoamerican peoples believe that there are a series of world creation and world destruction cycles. And for the Maya, we're in the fourth, and for the Aztec, we're in the fifth world. Uh, basically, the world will be created in one substance, like fire, and it will be destroyed by the opposite, like water. Uh, the end of the third creation often is talked about as a great flood. And for a long time, I thought that was, the, the flood stories were, you know, just Christian transfers of the Noah story. But now we've got it in pre-Columbian sources, so it's absolutely clear that the flood idea uh, is pre-Columbian as well as a transfer from Europe. And uh, in the beginning, the, the, many of the events occur in the third creation. There are two sets of hero twins who are born. One set which represents the concept of maize and its life cycle, and one set which are the sons of the maize gods. And basically what happens is the maize gods are called to the underworld where they're destroyed and killed. And the myth of creation is the quest of their children to go and defeat the lords of death and to resurrect their father, who is Maze. The story ends up with a whole bunch of really neat things. One, the, the main arena is the ball game. When we saw the ball court yeah, in the video. Yeah, right, right. And uh, it's like the Super Bowl that we saw not too <laughs> long ago. It's sort of the rough equivalent in our world of it. Uh, 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 uh. It's uh, the whole idea of a ball game is there are rules. You can anticipate what the outcome's going to be. That there's always the chance the underdog will win, and it's the uh, you know it's everything that we talk about with sport and all of that can be associated with the ball game also. And then the other thing that's really important here to understand is in the story. It's tied up with maize. Uh, maize cannot reproduce itself without human intervention because of the corn shucks. So it ends up with the idea that the world is 
exists in reciprocity between the supernatural and the human world. And then the great mystery is that in the story, the children go to the underworld and give birth to their father. Mm. And so in, in, in the mystery in Christianity, of course, is that God died for human beings, right? The mystery in Maya religion is that the children give birth to the father. And so it's this wonderful, wonderful story that locks into the way they experience the world. It's still there. I mean, you tell the story to creation. In fact, we did last summer. You tell it to modern Maya, and they say, yeah, because they still grow corn, right? It still ties directly into their lives. One of the things that I was struck by in reading about the, the story of, of the use of maize to mm -hmm, create mm -hmm. was that in the Christian faith, you always get the distinct impression that God is here and right. man is here. But in this myth, the maize creation scares the creator. He's, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He, he sort of comes back at him and, and becomes an equal in a sense. Right. Uh, the, 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 the gods try three times before the present creation to, to make human beings. They don't call it human beings, but they, they want to make creatures who will know what they've done and can acknowledge it and, and can then nourish and, and sustain them. And the, the, the final attempt, they make a creature of maize dough, so that, uh, and it results in human beings. And they realize immediately that human beings understand everything they understand. They understand creation. They, they, they understand everything. They can, they, everything, right? It's as if, you know, our, our, our physicists didn't have to figure out all of the stuff that they're looking at. They already knew it, and it scared them. Uh, another... No, no, but, but, but it's really neat here, because what the gods did is they didn't destroy their creation. What they did is they gave us amblyopia, so that we only understand what's close to us. What's between you and me, and we talk about is very clear, but if we get further and further and further away, it gets more and more confused. And that's very close to what human experience is mm. about. Mm. I, I also wanted to ask you about what, what you refer to as the soul force. Yeah, Chulao. Uh, um, it's a concept, again, that our physicists seem to be trying to, to, uh, to work on because it's very difficult for us to live in a world and in a cosmology which is essentially dead in which we're accidental. The Maya had the concept that everything is alive and it's imbued with what they call chulel, which is, chu is their word for God, chul is the thing that's sacred, and chulel is the quality of sacredness that is in everything. It's a living force. In human beings, it's in our blood but it can also be in places in the landscape. It can be in the instruments that we use. Like, I'm sure that my computer's got one. <laughs> and uh, they say that the most important interactions are not between human and human, or human and animal, or human and object, or human and landscape. It's between the chulel of these things. It's very much mm -hmm. like George Lucas's The Force. Star Wars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the concept is very close. We began the discussion talking about the, the early view of the Maya as mm -hmm. this utopian, um, cerebral kind of society, and then that it, it was more complex than that. That utopia was held up as a model by people who were looking for hope in modern times. Mm -hmm. Having this fuller understanding of who these people were and are, mm -hmm. What does that tell us about modern times? What's the new lesson, if any? I think this is a whole series of lessons uh, that, that's important for us. I think in the long run, the most important one may be is that all of us who are Americans, be we immigrants into these lands 30,000 years ago, or uh, 500 years ago, or 30 years ago, um, we're taught that the history of the Americas begins in 1492. That's what the Quincentennial was just about. What the Maya have given us is the mo one of the most detailed, rich, uh, precise, and uh, uh, rich histories, written histories, uh, 
that, uh, that any human society has left us. We have the, the events of this history tied down to minimum 24 hours and sometimes to a 12-hour period. You can't do that in Egypt. It, we, we know who their names are. We know who their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers and their great-great-grandfathers are. We know who they're fighting. We know the politics behind it. We know who their allies are. Lots of times we can figure out the strategy. Lots of times now in the archaeology, like at Copan in those tunnels, we can go to a place where they left an offering in the ground and not just say, wow, look at this neat offering, but we can say, gee, this was put here by 18 Rabbit on March the 23rd, 763, to dedicate this building. And we can now say what, it, what he was trying to do, what he was saying about the world when he did it. What that does is it gives Americans, and especially Native Americans, a written history that is as valuable, as important as anything we have from the old world. So when we teach our children world history, we ought to be teaching them the name of Hanab Pakal and Yashun Balam right alongside Tutankhamun and Julius Caesar. And it sounds like also there's a great deal more to learn. Oh, yeah, because we're just at the beginning. What the decipherment does is it gives us the raw material. And once you have the raw material, you have what we call history. And history is never objective. It's always a dialogue between the living and the past. And each generation gets to rewrite it over and over again. That's what the Maya have given us. Linda Sheely, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on Upon Reflection, your newest book, Maya Cosmos, 3,000 Years on the Shaman's Path, a terrific book. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.